from an urban school on Long Island, New York, to a tropical island boasting one of the greatest biodiversities on the planet. These exotic animals and a passionate herpetologist are bringing together children from two cultures half a world apart, traveling to a remote rainforest, armed with a laptop computer, old-fashioned showmanship, and with a little help from an alligator named Wally. He's on a quest to introduce the children of the world to the most fascinating creatures on Earth and to each other. It's the start of a typical day for Eric Callender. Like many suburban commuters, he packs a few essentials and heads off to work. We are very lucky today. We have with us Eric Reptile Adventures. Great time. We're going to get a chance to meet my favorite animals, which are reptiles, amphibians, and bugs. So how many guys like reptiles? Raise your hand. Eric Callender is on a one-man mission to change the way we think and feel about reptiles. It feels disgusting. Does it feel cool? You think it feels a little bit cool? And this is the toad. I became interested in reptiles when I was six years old. I was in the daycare center, and they had tadpoles. I saw the tadpoles and I loved the tadpoles. And then someone brought in the turtle and I fell in love with the turtle. But then it really got intense when my parents sent me away to camp when I was nine. And I found a toad and then I found a turtle and then I found a snake and I found a frog and that was it. And there was no real explanation to why. It just, I just loved it. Hey, what's your name? For the past five years, Eric has traveled to hundreds of schools in the New York area, introducing thousands of students and more than a few adults to his lizards, snakes, amphibians, and reptiles. His menagerie includes a prehistoric turtle. Oh, she's got it that time. Look, there she goes. All right. Feels like water. And a 14-foot albino python. At the end of the assembly, we're all going to get a chance to touch him. So she'll eat rats, chicken, fish, turtles. Wally, his alligator, is a crowd favorite. Everybody stick your left foot like that, and your right foot like that, and wave your hands in the air like that, and put it all together. <laughs> Eric entertains his audiences with unbounded energy and an infectious charisma. So we're going to find out if he, if he turns to a prince. Let's see. Ready? <laughs> awesome. So, so now nervous still, sometimes cruel. But at heart, he is a teacher who is passionate about his subject. The stomach is wet, and, and that's how they drink. So if you have pollution in the environment, can affect the frogs. Being a kid myself, the kid-like and always curious about everything, it's easy to work with kids because I was always excited about learning new things. And it was easy to teach the kids because that's what they wanted. So I could just be silly and just be myself. Sometimes my friends are like, Eric, why are you getting all crazy over reptiles? The kids wouldn't ask me that. OK, so here, put your hands up, put your hands up. I say, well, stick them to your hands. So one on Caesar's hand and one on Jasmine's hand. So everybody give Caesar and Jasmine a big hand. Good job, you guys. Now, these frogs actually come from... He's undauntable. From There's no stopping Madagascar Eric. He has a mission. His mission is to communicate his love for what he does with children and hopefully inspire them to love it as well. And in an, almost as an aside, he educates them in a way that no one else is doing. Boas have extra strong skills so they can climb trees. So even a boa constrictor that's not a tree boa can still climb trees. Could it, no, well, if she got mad, she would bite, like, she would bite first. That, that's what they do oh, depend on. They don't just like come up to you and like choke you. So that wouldn't be good for Chick Kedra because he's around his neck right now. But <laughs> he gets but, kids but, excited but yes, about seeing live they, snakes. They scream and they giggle. But then Eric lays down the science to them also. And that's what's going to draw them in to, to learning more about them and learning about biology and learning about science in general. Checking out of my hotel now. Time to get ready for our show. 
Hey, Wally. Get ready to go. <laughs> and Wally and I are off to our show. <laughs> Say hi, I met Eric at Salvation yeah, Teaching and Learning and three years ago, and I always say that every time you go to a conference, you can bring one thing back from it, then you benefit from the conference. And I've had him come now three years in a row, and I still have kids coming back and saying, when's Eric coming? I want to come and see him. So they remember these experiences a lot more than they would remember reading something in a textbook. Eventually, be 26 Eric's reptile shows have become an integral part of the science curriculum at many of the schools. Put a tail this way. He is infused into our science curriculum. I work with the science teachers so that they can bring him in during the time that they're talking about reptiles. And so they might do lesson planning on reptiles and then Eric comes to bring the live show. He does 10 shows in a week's period and every sixth grade student gets to see his show. They really learn more about animals when they get to see a live animal, handle a live animal, experience it in person. That helps them to understand it at a deeper level and also to have a more vivid association with the facts that they're learning that will help the facts kind of stick more in their memories. Eric, would you like to thank the Terry for PTA and for Eric? Yes, thank you. <laughs> After every show, at every school, he gets the same reaction. But when Eric does a show at an urban school, he brings an added dimension. He's a young African-American male who had an interest in reptiles, and the community of my school is um, a mixture of Latino and African-American students, and I thought that he would be a good role model. So when I brought him into the show, most of the kids were amazed at the fact that there was someone who was look like them, that was the giving them so a presentation a rat, so about we reptiles. Should, we should, yeah, Many desert, children yes, exactly, in the urban desert, areas, a lot of their role models might be a rapper or a basketball player I mean, or a football player. Like, not that there's anything cool, wrong with that, but as far as having African-Americans in science, there's not a lot of African-Americans in science, and I think that's the thing that should be important for the kids to have that other option, you know what I mean? So it gives them another option of something that they might want to do. Different from when they're squeezing to like eat something, so he can't eat you, I promise, but no. I still think it's universal, like where kids don't see color, so it could be something that any kid would want to do. It's really great for kids to be exposed to the natural world, especially in the inner city where they may be seeing nothing but concrete their whole lives. Eric brings them these reptiles and amphibian species so they can see that aspect of the natural world that they might otherwise never get to see. They get to see it up close, they get to touch it. The hardest working herpetologist in show business, Eric is often booked at two or three schools a day. This is the green room where all the animals hang out before the show. We have more than 50 species, including Wally, my American alligator, Twinkie, the Burmese python, Godzilla and Missy, the rhinoceros iguanas, and Biowak, my monitor lizard. Look, look along the edge. For five years, Eric has brought the wild into the classroom. Now he wants to bring the classroom into the wild. At every opportunity, he mentions the name of a far off land. It's right there, Madagascar. Look at that snake that we see in Madagascar. To a certain area in Madagascar. When we did the, the program in Madagascar. I mean, Madagascar is one of the places. Madagascar. Madagascar. Let's go to Madagascar first. Especially in Madagascar. There's a host. Madagascar ground boa constrictors. And we're even going to see animals from the island of Madagascar. Halfway around the world from New York, off the coast of Africa, the island of Madagascar is a prime destination for biologists. Over 300 species of reptiles found nowhere else in the world live in Madagascar's rainforests. Eric has always dreamed of studying Madagascar's unique reptiles firsthand. And he has conceived of a plan to bring his students along with him. It'd be fun to make videos for the kids, but then wouldn't it be better to just show them live as I'm finding things? Because I get super excited, so it's like, oh, this would be great. I could show them as we're finding things in the jungle. It might not necessarily he wants to use the internet to deliver live reptile shows area. from the rainforest of Madagascar oh, I got that too. back to the schools in New York. That's when I came up with the idea, okay, look, we're, we're definitely going to Skype with these kids. But then I'm like, well, who are you going to Skype with? And it's like, well, contact all those science teachers that you know, having a dynamic approach to education. The administration, they're always supportive of new learning experiences. As soon as I told them about the Madagascar Skyping opportunity, they were all about it. Yes, do it. Let's get it done. It just speaks to the digital world that we live. Now, I will tell you, when Eric first talked to me about his idea of going over to Madagascar and utilizing Skype sessions, 
questions, there is that component where you're like, you know, how is this going to work? So when he asked if it was possible to do this in our school, I was like, okay, let's try it. Eric arrives in Antananarivo, the capital of Madagascar. Antananarivo means city of a thousand. Today, the capital has a population of almost a million and a half people. So hey, we're in Madagascar now. We finally made it. I'm so excited. And um, look around, we're in the city right now. Truthfully, I can't wait to get to the jungle, but <laughs> this is all part of it. So you can see all the people, the buildings. Just checked into the hotel and I'm really excited to be here. If you look around, you can see all the, the buildings and the houses and mixed with the trees. You can smell in the air, you can smell uh, smoke. The smoke in the uh, air is from people cooking. Everyone's cooking now. And so you can smell uh, wood burning and coal burning. First on the agenda, Eric catches up with his mentor, renowned primatologist, Dr. Pat Wright. Yes. Welcome, Eric. It's wonderful to finally see you here yes. in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. And this is a, it's a big town now. It's a yes. busy town. Mm -hmm. It's got three million people. Wow. And yet, it still has rice paddies. You can see in the back. Yes, yes. Rice paddies in the middle of the city. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing place. Yes. When I first got here, there weren't any cars, but now we're going to worry a little bit about traffic. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to take off tomorrow. We're going to see some stuff. You know, Madagascar has such incredible animals and plants, you know, endangered species that are found nowhere else in the world. Right? Wait to see it. Yeah. <laughs> I really can't wait to see it. Hey Benjamin, hey, Rick. nice Welcome to meet you. Nice Thank to you. Meet you. This is your research permit. I didn't want to take animals from the wild because that's not the right thing to do. Plus, every organism contributes something to the environment, so you don't want to disturb that. So what we decided to do was get a permit to catch and release. The Malagasy government gave me a permit to do that. On this research permit um, will allow me to uh, capture and release okay, and five release. different five species per day. Yes. Okay, perfect. Eric meets his team. How do you say? Um, thank you, and I guess it's Saucha. Saucha? Saucha. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Madagascar's government requires all foreign researchers to employ local guides. The next morning, Eric takes a brief tour of the capital, but he is anxious to get out of the city. He has one day before his first live show for the students back in New York. He heads out on a scouting mission. We're on our way to a Perias garden. We see lots of uh, herbs, reptiles, and amphibians that um, that were bred by a man that uh, Pat was mentioning to me, and his name was Perias, that uh, um, bred many herbs from different areas of Madagascar. So that's where we're gonna go now to see if we can um, borrow some animals for part of our program. So where do, where do we start? Well, first we're gonna see some crocodiles. Oh, no way! Yeah. Look. Oh, he's right there. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, wow. These are now crocodiles that we're looking at right now. The guide told me they were there since they were this big, since they were small. And uh, they raised them here. So he says this one here is 25 years old. But I know they get much, much bigger. <laughs> the difference between crocodiles and alligators, if you look at this crocodile here, you can see right at the top of the snout, you can see the, the, no, the snout is very narrow and you can see the top of the nostrils there. Then if you look at the teeth, the teeth, the fourth tooth are sticking up on the, on the left. But I also say half smile alligator, full smile crocodile. So the alligator, the top teeth stick out and the adults and crocodiles, all the teeth stick out. If you're looking from the top though, you can see the fourth tooth is pretty exaggerated with the uh, crocodile. Eric asked the park's guides to let him enter the crocodile enclosure. It's just beautiful. They have never had a request like this before, and they are concerned for his safety. He's sleeping. I let him sleep. He reassures um, them, telling ago, them about Wally, his alligator at home. I mean, I can pick her up. She doesn't, she's not aggressive towards me at all, and she actually knows my voice. Unlike American alligators, Nile crocodiles are extremely aggressive. The guides are still wary, but Eric finally convinces them. Here at the garden, they have to feed the animals, and so they've allowed me to feed the crocodiles here, so we're gonna see if she wants to eat. Hey, honey. Hold on. Good 
Gotta watch out for this. Oh, this one just ate it. She ate it, I think. Oh, the guy behind you, Eric. It's okay, it's okay, no worries, no worries. Yes, yeah, she goes. They do eat people sometimes, but um, it's not the crocodile's fault, it's just the way they hunt. So you don't want to go near water where there's crocs because they'll, they can confuse you for uh, the prey that they normally eat, which would be small game, uh, small, you know, uh, here we have uh, like a, a buffalo type animal that they might eat small, zebu. There's the ear. They can hear everything we're saying and they can smell too. They have a good sense of, of smell. They can detect pressure with pressure sensors on their jaws. They have pressure sensors so they can detect that so they know that we're here. <laughs> I have no fear for them. No, not at all. It's all understanding because I know about them and I work with them every day. So even the ones that could possibly hurt me, I, I'm, I'm not afraid of them. I just, um, I respect them. The crocs have finished feeding and Eric's biggest thrill lies just behind these walls. Oh, look. <laughs> look at this. Look at them. Oh, that's awesome. It's amazing. And you can see the coloration of this chameleons. They almost look like rocks, but or, or branches, just the branches. And you see they can blend into the branches or, or rocks. Uh, if you look at their eyes really closely, you can see that all, all chameleons have this feature, but the eyes move independently of the other eye. So they can see in any direction. My God, I've never seen one like this. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. Oh, it's okay, look. Oh my goodness, look at this. This is, now, now, now the, this is a Frucifer pardalis. Yes, wow, this is amazing. She's coming down a little bit. Eric is like a kid in a candy she's store. Back. She's getting a little stressed out. When he sees like something higher, he's like, oh, that's higher, and then I'll go higher. And he's about to come face to face. <laughs> wow! With an animal oh he's been searching for oh, his wow. entire career. Yo, this is like not even real. <laughs> For herpetologists, there's species that you haven't seen before. You know, there was species of chameleons that I hadn't seen in person before. I've seen a Parsons chameleon once in a pet store. You know, it wasn't the same thing I've seen in the wild. You can see how gorgeous they are. The male look, there's all this blue and these, these bright orange eyes that look like highlighters. Amazing. <laughs> and he has this horn on his, like a, on, on his nose, like almost like a prehistoric in a way. Just gorgeous. And then over here, look, there's the females over there, the female Parsons chameleon. If you see, sir, sometimes when they see a, a female, they, 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 they may uh, bob their head and communicate that way. The Parsons chameleon, like all the chameleons, is, mm -hmm. is very, very rare yes. and going extinct yeah. because the forests are disappearing. Yes. And we're really lucky to have this place here right. where people can see the extraordinary treasures that are in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. And they can understand that to lose these pieces of beauty forever mm -hmm would be a terrible tragedy. Yes, absolutely. This is Kaluma viviconis, which looks like it has elephant ears, or like a frilled dragon even. <laughs> Amazing. Eric is overwhelmed by the diversity of Madagascar's chameleons. In addition to chameleons, Madagascar has other reptiles found nowhere else in the world. <laughs> Madagascar, oh my god, I've, this is, I've never seen a um, hognose snake uh, this large. We have an eastern hognose snake in, uh, in, in the United States, uh, in Long Island, where, where I live, and uh, this is a, a Malagasy variety, and you can see they call them hognose snakes because they have a nose that they use as a shovel so that they can actually dig out nests of, of other animals. So, uh, say if a lizard lays eggs, they can actually dig up the, the lizard's uh, uh, eggs with that, and also the, uh, the forked tongue. They have this, um, uh, they're able to find food by using a vomer nasal organ or Jacobson's organ in their mouth. And so uh, it's like a nose in their mouth. So they have a nose in their mouth. That's how able, they're able to find the food. So in here, he's, he's getting a, a, a Madagascar tree boa, a Sanzinia madagascarensis. Wow, look at this snake, look at this. Tree boas, um, since they hunt not only for, for rodents, they can flick their tongue to find food, but also look at this snake, oh my gosh. Look, look at the, um, the, you can see the labial pits. They have these heat sensing pits. And this one's a relatively young one. I've seen them, uh, they get larger than this. They get uh, pretty, pretty big, so larger than six feet long. Um, but they can get too large, like say uh, pythons, which can go 20 feet. Boas don't get that big because boas spend their time in trees. So you can see, look at the way the, you can see how it's wrapped around my arm. Like that, boas, this characteristic can, can hang on like that with no problem. So it's my arms, the, the branch <laughs> right now for the snake. 
Wow, this is just a beautiful snake, though. It is. Look at how it's almost, you know, that green color. Mm -hmm. When they first shed their skin, they're like turquoise. Yeah, yes. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. See all the iridescence. It's not only Madagascar's large reptiles that Eric finds impressive. Some of the island's smallest species are also its most endangered. This is the Brookesia chameleon, the smallest chameleon in the world that lives in Madagascar in the leaf litter. And you can see how tiny it is. It barely fits on my finger. See how tiny this chameleon is? So they have to eat tiny food. As a matter of fact, they have to be careful not to be food for other animals because they're so, so small. This is a Madagascar mantella frog. You can find this throughout the forest of Madagascar. And there's many other species of mantellas. That's just jumping away, hold on. <laughs> Come back, frog. The bright coloration is uh, warning colors to predators not to eat them. But unlike poison dart frogs, they're not poisonous to human beings. I mean, if you ate it, maybe, I don't know, but... <laughs> Madagascar's endemic species are known for their ingenious adaptations to the environment, as Eric observes firsthand. Oh, look at the tail. The tail's like a leaf. So you can see all the geckos, the leaf-tailed geckos, they have tails that look like leaves, and so they can blend in. This is a, um, a leaf-tailed gecko, another species of leaf-tailed gecko. They always sleep with their face down, head down this way when they're sleeping. Most of the time you see them, when you see them and they're resting in the daytime, they're sleeping face down. Maybe for circulation and you can see they can all jump. You can see a whole jump. Okay, so look, this is the, the, the female variety of, this, of the same lizard, but you can see it looks completely different. Uh-oh, your mouth is open, okay. That means she wants me to put her down. <laughs> Eric could easily spend the rest of the day at the reserve. If his first live show weren't scheduled for tomorrow, the team returns to Antananarivo to prepare for the show. They decide to use the reptiles at Parius Reserve as a test before taking on the difficult logistics of doing live shows from the rainforest. In New York, the students are excited to be part of Eric's first live session from Madagascar. The team has arrived at the reserve. But there's a problem. The surrounding mountains prevent Eric from getting a signal from the cell tower. Without a signal, he cannot send his show back to New York. With less than 15 minutes to show time, Eric desperately climbs to higher ground, searching for a signal. Hold on, I'm gonna get you on. The thing that stressed me out most wasn't so much the technology, it was the fact that I knew that these children were waiting on the other side, wanting to see something cool, and then the possibility that it wasn't gonna work was very, very scary. I was like, no, this has to work, because I'm, I know they're depending on me. We have Eric coming from Madagascar. He's Skyping with us, he's calling. I think I'm gonna answer the phone right now. Hello, Eric, how are you? Hi, I'm Eric, how are you? Good, good morning, Eric. Hey, you guys. So we're here in Madagascar at uh, Paris Gardens. It's a uh, preserve. There's a problem with the internet connection. What's, what, what do you see? Yours is too slow? All right, can you guys see me? Hang on one second, guys. We're going to get you a chameleon. Eric's location is so remote, this is the best signal he can hope for. Despite the technical limitations, the show must go on. The biggest chameleon in Madagascar. We're going to see it now. We'll see two. I think the students reacted to the rust buzz like, what happened? What's going on? And when it came back on, they were like, OK, we're back. And I think Eric's perspective, it was a frustration because he wants to meet our needs. He wants to make it smooth. He wants to make sure that we're getting every aspect of what he has to talk about. And so when that happened, our kids were like, what's going on? What's happening? The teacher's like you're looking at the computer. What's going on? What's happening? But then when it came back up, he was fine. This is the female, Parsons Chameleon. And look at this is the male. Can you guys see him? Very different, very different. And that's the two of them together. Look how they can hang on. OK. So what can you tell me about the feet of the chameleon? No, they're not webbed. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is here. We're going to hold this one for one second. I'll show you guys how to do it. So here, check this out. Go like this with your hands. Every, everybody, go like that with your hands. And put your hands together like that and like this. And if you go like this, they can pinch the leaves like this with their hands. So you can see how she's pinching onto my hands. If you look very closely, 
You can see her hand. Look at her hand. Doing it live is, is more exciting even for them because they feel like they're there with you. You're living and you're breathing and you're there and then they're there with you now. So it's like even though it's on the computer screen, it's, you're bringing them there and they feel that. As Eric shows off a menagerie of exotic creatures. Look guys, look at this one. This is... He abruptly loses signal. Oh gosh, it cut out again. It can't happen like this again. The show goes offline in New York. Oh, this wasn't a test, this is the first one. We have 30 more to go. If we lost connection, our teacher would then pick up and say, what did Eric talk about while we're waiting for the connection to come up? What snake was he talking about? Do you remember what forest did he say he found it from? You know, what were the habitats of this snake? And then the connection would come back on and it would be, let's go back to where the lesson was. Everybody, did you guys all hear me? Yes! yes. We're as excited to see you as you are to see them. We're in, in a remote place in Madagascar. That's why I guess the connection's not so good. But this place is an animal preserve in the middle of the woods. So now, let's ask some qu we're, we're, we're gonna get a boa now, but we wanna see if you have questions. Eric, what is the slowest animal in Madagascar? Are there any mosquitoes in Madagascar? Any poisonous snake in Madagascar? This is... Madagascar tree boa. We're able to talk to Eric live from Madagascar. It's not a film strip, it's not a video. So We're able to interact with him, get to see the animals. The children can ask questions and have an immediate response. Uh, this makes it real to them and it's something they'll remember forever. Hog no snake. And the fact so that he takes his look. work around this the world and then brings our children with him is so exciting. Bye. Today was our first day, and yes, it was a, a little bit crazy, hair on fire kind of day. And uh, we were driving um, back out to this preserve because we really wanted to come here to show the diversity of, of animals. Um, we didn't have a, a good, we had a good internet connection when we got out here, and then the connection kept dropping out. So we were walking all over here, trying to find the proper connection, and then we got the connection, and then I was too dark, all right? <laughs> and then we moved the computer, and then I was light, and everything worked good, and then the connection slowed down. So it was a little bit crazy, um, but it was our our first, uh, our first Skype session, but we did get to do something good and that was share the diversity of um, animals from Madagascar with the kids. The next morning, Eric leaves Antananarivo. He's finally heading for the rainforest. It's a full day's drive from the capital, so they pick up some provisions for the ride. The trip takes them on a winding excursion through the Malagasy countryside. The landscape is dotted with rice paddies. Rice is the staple food of Madagascar, which has one of the highest rates of rice consumption in the world. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Many families eat rice three times a day. Rice is such an important part of Malagasy diet and culture. On the way from the capital, we must have seen hundreds of rice paddies, just like this one. Despite the postcard-like scenery, the journey through never-ending rice fields is troublesome to Eric. He knows this serene landscape underlies Madagascar's environmental dilemma. In a practice called slash and burn, forest is cut, burned, and then planted with rice. All of these rice fields were once lush tropical rainforests. Slash and burn is a very destructive form of agriculture. Unfortunately, it is widely practiced here in Madagascar. Halfway through the trip, the team pulls into town for lunch. In the cities, as well as the countryside, the poverty of this island nation is visible everywhere. Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world. Human power is still one of the major modes of transportation. It's another five hours, with the roads getting worse, before reaching the Center Val Bio Research Station on the edge of the rainforest in Ranomafana National Park. <laughs> Good to see you. I've been waiting to get here for the longest and I'm finally here, so thank you guys. Yeah, Founded really by Eric's mentor, Dr. Right, Pat Wright. 
Centerval Bio is Madagascar's leading field research facility. I'm Eric. Uh, Eric. I'm, I'm nice, Gano. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Yes. Maurice. Maurice. Nice to meet you, Maurice. Yes. So you guys have been uh, looking for some animals for me. Did you yeah. find anything? Yeah, I, uh, I found a uh, snake. Oh my God, you got it! <laughs> wow! Oh my God, he got it! <laughs> wow! Oh, it's beautiful! Wow! Oh my gosh! It's a, a Madagascar tree boa! <gasps> wow! Oh my God! She's beautiful! Where, where did you find her? This morning. This morning! Wow! Oh my goodness! This is awesome! Wow, this is a Madagascar tree boa, Sanzinia. Madagascarensis, whoa, whoa, she's a, she's a little upset. Okay, 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 okay. Let her calm down a little bit. A little too much excitement for her. <laughs> snake. <laughs> See, look. Despite snake. living in the shadow of the rainforest their entire lives, most Malagasy have a fear of snakes. How do you say gentle, gentle? Mura, 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 mura. Eric cannot resist giving an impromptu lesson on the local ecology. That's nice. That's good. Can you try to touch her? It's okay. It's okay. I can't believe I just arrived and my guides found this juvenile Madagascar tree boa. And I really hope we find a big one before the end of the trip. We're just going to bring her to the temporary holding area. Oh, that one. Can you see me? There's no time to relax after their long day's drive. Um, you're a little blurry. I mean, Eric has 30 shows scheduled set. over yeah, the next two weeks. Right, I'm sorry, guys. He but, does um, his first we'll show we'll do as soon as he arrives. In Madagascar, there's, there's, um, can you guys see it? All right, this one, they just actually found it in the jungle and it's actually shedding his skin. Let's look at the adaptations of the chameleon. So um, besides camouflage, do you guys other, know other adaptations that chameleons have? Rotate it's important that I broadcast degrees. from here because so a huge percentage of what we have is gone already. This is what's left here and it's still intact and I think and it's important for, for people like to, so able to to share that and understand it. That Getting it's intact, out. it's still here and that we can still save what's left. All right, watch his tongue. Can you see it? After our shows, we always release the animals back to where we found them, and that was our agreement with the park and the parameters of our license. And it's always important to always leave nature as you found it, and that's what I teach all my kids. And so let's put her right back where we found her. And now it's time to go find some more animals for our next show. The morning mist hangs over the village of Rano Mafana. But Eric is up early. Rafia chameleon. Yeah. This is the best kind of chameleon to have because you don't have to feed it. <laughs> Malagasy is known for making all sorts of things from raffia, which is a plant from Madagascar. It's a palm tree, and here's one of the items to help keep me organized. So I can remember to mail my bills. <laughs> and my friends, Jose's hat is made of raffia also. <laughs> After months of waiting and planning, he will spend today in the rainforest. With more than 160 square miles, Rano Mafana National Park is home to rare species of plants and animals found nowhere else in the world. Just got my badge, I'm really excited about this. We're gonna look for herps all day, reptiles and amphibians. Uh, Anya and Jose, our guides, are gonna help us find chameleons, snakes, lizards, frogs, anything we can find. If they get also, they, they stand on the trunk like this and they look like a moss. This big plant is a traveler's palm tree native to Madagascar. It's the national plant of Madagascar, which is used to help build houses. And also, if you're really thirsty, you can put a hole in it and have a drink. And that's why they call it the traveler's palm tree. Joining Eric on today's outing are students from New York Stony Brook University who are studying the local ecology at the Center Val Bio Research Station. He's looking at his eyeball, awesome. We're looking at um, Pokesias, a very small species of chameleon, and they're very cryptic, they can hide, and so we just found one here. I don't want to pick it up and disturb it because it's wild. Yeah, we've seen a couple of them here so far. Now they're nocturnal, but it's, it's active in the daytime. 
Jose tells Eric the guides have found something up ahead. So we're looking at a leaf-tailed gecko that looks just like a leaf that's right over my head. Beautiful. Jose, I think we should use it for the program. We should. Okay. Okay. I think so. Wow. I'm looking like right in his eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry, little gecko. Alright, now he's on my back my back again. But this is a wild gecko. Alright, hold on. He's gonna crawl around. Yeah, he's crawling around the scenes right here. The day gets hotter as Eric treks deeper into the rainforest. He hopes to find an adult tree boa, but he's on the lookout for all of Madagascar's exotic reptiles. I'm hiking through a stream here in Ranamafana National Park. A stream is a great place to find frogs because the frogs will sometimes come here to lay their eggs. Some frogs might even lay their eggs on the edge of leaves, the tree frogs, and when the offspring hatch, the offspring will fall right into the water. Really amazing. All right, we've been hiking down the trail now and there's some leeches. Well, this is a tiny one, but it was just on my foot. But that's the price you gotta pay to come in the jungle. No worries. <laughs> is it me, just me or did you, did you notice? Like, look yeah, at his, his eyes, it. right? It looks a little, just here, just hold him yourself. You can probably feel it more than you, when you see it, but just look at how he is. A little bit, you know, a little bit off. You see what I'm saying? Look at his eyes. You see his eyes? Just found a leaf-tailed gecko, it's Europlates sicori, and we found it here on this tree. And we just took it off, but notice that the tail on this one is missing as well. But um, it looks like it's pretty fresh. Within the last day or two, the tail was taken off, and he seems like a little woozy. So maybe this one, uh, if we take it back, we can um, we can put it in, uh, and rehabilitate it, and give it lots of bugs and uh, some maybe some vitamins, and uh, and and get it back to health because it seems it doesn't seem right. Uh, the way he is, but you can see the tails off right here. Um, but either way, guys, just look at the bark. You can see the bark, uh, how the bark looks exactly like his skin. It looks like he has moss growing on his skin, but that's actually not moss. That's just the way the skin is for camouflage. Wow, we just got back from our first hike in the rainforest, and it was amazing. We got to see some really cool animals, and I've been waiting for this trip for six months, <laughs> and finally it's here. And tonight we're going to be able to share all the animals we found on Skype tonight with the kids. The shows feature many of the specimens Eric and the team collected in the rainforest. During the first show, he is again plagued by the now familiar delays caused by an unreliable internet connection. This is in a costume. I need a day off, that's what I need. If he wasn't able to see us, there would be a feed coming through, whether it was written. Sorry, we lost I'm trying to get this back. I'm trying to get this on. I'm not forgetting about you guys. All right, hold on, guys. We're working on it. He was still trying to maintain on. the connection with us and then would pop back on and it would go smoothly. All right, hold on. Let's see. Oh, wait, here's another frog. Oh, wait, they're all going to jump away. Oh, wait, here's one, guys. Okay, okay. All right, guys, now we have a couple of tree frogs here. Here's another tree frog. The kids were great. I mean, we had them in the library, and, um, you know, the connection would go down, and as a, a collective, oh, you know, through the thing, and just hang tight, hang tight, and the kids were sitting there, and they would be continuing to ask me questions, and I would say, just hold it. Wait till we get the connection back, and the connection would come back. Oh, everybody was all excited, and so they understood. They, it kind of made it more real that the, he was so far away and that this wasn't, you know, Skyping with the guy down the hall, so I think that brought a much more real aspect back to the whole experience yeah, you for see them. the eyes, and everybody say the word Arborio. The day is getting long. The time difference between Madagascar and New York forces Eric to do many of his shows into the night. We're gonna see another one that's much, much smaller. It's only about, about two inches long. Yeah. So geckos like this will stick their tongue out and that's how they, they taste the environment. Not like a snake though, different from a snake, but they can taste things that they wanna eat. Like sometimes geckos will eat fruits, Compounding the problem, electrical power in the rainforest is often unreliable, causing the lights to flicker. Let me see if I switch back to the other one if it works. 
Day Day um, audio visual guy was able to bring a new light in because I'm dark skin. So when you're dark skin on camera, you have to have extra light. And so I got some extra light from Day Day, and um, that actually helps the program because um, they can see not just me, but they can see the animals. I think it's important when you do the online programs that the children see your expression, to see your enthusiasm in your face, and also be able to see the animals very well because that's the point is for them to be able to interact and see that way. And so um, online, that's very important. Oh wait, it's crawling on my face. <laughs> Undaunted. Eric is excited to share his new discoveries with the kids in New York. All right, so it's hard to work with frogs, guys, that are wild because they jump all over. So, um, but anyway, guys, look at this frog now. Um, you can see. It was fun being on the cutting edge and sharing with the kids. It wasn't fun when we had a blackout. It was like, no, come on. I mean, at one point, I was there with a candle, trying to Skype with a candle because then some some battery power left on my computer. So certain things you just you know you can't control. It's longer than its body. That's Over the next oh week, God, guys, Eric performs two all. to three shows a day here. for the schools here, back in the States. I'm going to kind of move it really slowly so you can see. It's a demanding wow. schedule, <laughs> and he earns a much-needed day off. Jose, yes. this is when, where they, when they pound the rice? Yeah, that's its deep, uh, special tools. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is our the clean. Yeah. So those leaves, those leaves. Okay. You can boil the, the sweet potato leaves? Yeah. What's that? This is cassava leaves. This is this one. Oh, this is fun. I like this. Today's Sunday. It's Market Day in Rana Mafana. Lots of fun, lots of energy. You can purchase fruits, vegetables, all sorts of things. And everybody comes here to socialize. It's a social event, and it's a wonderful day here in Rana Mafana. The distinctive rhythms of Malagasy music resound throughout the village. Some of the local musicians invite Eric to join them in an impromptu sing-along as the rhythm of life in this rainforest community unfolds before him. Okay, here we go. All right. Eric has become a conspicuous presence in the village of Rana Mafana. Here we go. All right, it's working. I got it. Wow, this is not as bad as I thought. Word has spread quickly of the foreign herpetologist who collects reptiles in the rainforest to show to children in America. Rano is the Malagasy word for water. Mafana means hot. A hundred years ago, hot springs were discovered in the valley, which gave the village its name. Eric pays a visit to the springs with a slight diversion. We're heading to the hot springs now to see if there are any snakes there. The locals say that there's a big boa that lives here. Maybe we're going to catch a boa right now, hopefully. <laughs> pool is like right down there. Oh, there's a whole pool? Yeah. Oh, nice. Once again, the search for an adult tree boa comes up empty. So I'm just looking around. Sometimes you might see a snake or a lizard crawling in the, in the uh, low grass. But um, the best place to find them is near rocks when it gets warm because the snakes can thermoregulate, warm their bodies because they're cold-blooded, so they warm their bodies by rocks. Especially Madagascar because it seems that here, the nighttime, it gets really cool. It's, it's like 60 degrees at night, and the daytime gets up to, into the 80s. So it's a 20-degree difference in temperature, so the snakes need to be near where there's rocks. So hopefully tomorrow morning, We'll check out some by some rocks and uh, we'll see some. Okay. A quick stop for something to eat. Musaucha. This is really tasty. This is Malagasy banana bread. It's very, very good. And they are off to the hot springs. We also have a swimming pool here mm -hmm. where people can swim. Everybody can come here to swim. Yeah. And the bath and the massage. Oh, nice. So is that what we're going to do now? Yeah. <laughs> These are the hot springs that Rana Mafana was named after. I'm gonna put my feet in it. Ah, it's nice. <laughs> it's really hot. Wow, it's really hot. <laughs> Hotter than I expected, but wow, it's like a hot, hot bath. How do you say? How do you say it feels good? How do you say it feels good? Huh? Mafinacha. Mafinacha. So Rana Mafana is not just good for reptiles, but it's also good for, uh, for getting a hot bath <laughs> and chilling in the hot springs. So this warm. No, this is perfect right here. Refreshed and rejuvenated, Eric is ready to get back to business. All right, time to head back. I got my Skype session.
Eric's activities over the last week have made the Malagasy children curious about the wildlife in their own backyard. So the Center Valbio staff arranges for him to do a live show at the local village school. But I was just thinking of logistically how I would do it without my animals. But then when I got there, I'm like, wait, we have animals right here. The animals we're using for the show, we can do it. I'm like, yes. And so I was really excited. I was like, I'm going to get to do a show with these children. The weather is always unpredictable in the rainforest. But Eric is undaunted by the sudden downpour. The animal we're going to see. Or by the language lemur, barrier. But it's not a lemur. And then I spoke with Jose, my guy, and I was like, Jose, can you translate? You know, and he's like, yeah, I can translate. So once we had that, I'm like, okay, this is going to be great. Everybody say chameleon. So this chameleon lives in your forest, in the forest right behind us. Traditionally, the Malagasy children do not venture into the rainforest and know little of their country's wildlife. It's friendly. So say hi, chameleon. Hello, <laughs> guys, touch it. It's okay. They didn't know a lot of the, the, the animals that we saw. I guess they knew what a snake was, but they hadn't seen any of their own species of snakes. They knew what a chameleon was, but they hadn't seen any of their own species of chameleons. You know, as children, they're just not exposed to it. They weren't out in the forest looking for them. And it's kind of a universal thing with kids that live in, you know, a town or a city that if they're not exposed to it, they won't, they won't really seek it out. So it's good to be able to bring that to them so they know what's living in the forest and they know why you want to conserve it. It needs the forest because it lives in trees, so he can... As always, Eric's goal is to educate as well as to entertain. But it doesn't, it doesn't hurt it because he has a special tail. It's a, called the prehensile tail. It's a tail that's like a hand, so everybody go like that with your hand. So he can stick with his hands. He has sticky hands. She can hold it like this, see? <laughs> so they can hang on because they have special feet. That's why the chameleon can do that. When you work with children, I've learned that it's the same no matter where you are. And that was one of the most exciting parts for me in Madagascar was that I thought it was going to be so different teaching in front of these children, but I did the same thing I would do for any of the kids, with the exception of the translator. You know, so we had a translator there, but when I'm watching the kids, I'm like, wow, look at them shouting and jumping up and down. And it's like, wow, it's like, kids, when I'm in the U.S., they do the same thing. It's like, so it's like, kids are kids. The, the reactions and the excitement was just as good as when we were in the States. All right, guys, now, now maybe we can let you touch it. You guys want to touch the tail? You can touch the tail. Touch the tail. And the chameleon. Here, try, guys. Hey, like this. <laughs> the Malagasy children and a few of the adults are introduced to their own biodiversity. He always emphasizes conservation, and I think that that's one of the most important things to to make kids appreciate that the, the things that we do have consequences for the natural world. Eric is gentle, reaching kids gentle. early with that gentle, message. you guys, gentle. <laughs> By promoting awareness and appreciation for all of Madagascar's reptiles, Eric gently confronts their traditional fear of snakes. Maybe the most important misconception is that we need to like them to preserve them. We think that reptiles have to do something for us for them to be worthy of trying to preserve and study and understand. The children's natural curiosity wins the day. After the show, Eric hands out wristbands, crayons, and pictures of the animals. This is uh, pictures of native animals from Madagascar. So when I was younger, I was inspired by, by, by pictures and coloring and of things that I really enjoyed, which was reptiles and animals. And uh, I hope to inspire the kids the same way, to, to respect nature and enjoy things. And, you know, it starts with something as simple as this. <laughs> it may not be much to kids in American schools, but it is a special event for the Malagasy children especially meeting a role model they can relate to. Obviously, you know, they thought I was Malagasy, so there was points in time when they were like, oh, you know, you, 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 we didn't know you were not from Madagascar till you spoke. <laughs> and then when I spoke to them, I think that was encouraging for them that somebody from America that's black and, you know, looks like us, and, you know, he's teaching us about some of the, the, the life here, and I think the children really appreciated it. It means so much to me to be able to share nature with kids. And so that's the most important element I can bring is share nature with them and 
give them an appreciation for what they have and hopefully they may not want to chop their forest down when the logger comes and says we want to chop the forest down they'll say I'm an Eric the Reptile guy and I'm not chopping the forest down we're not going to do that so um, I think that's where it really makes the big difference. The next day some of the village children returned to the site of Eric's show. Yesterday was so much fun. The children had a chance to color in their pictures. It was great. And now we're displaying their artwork here on this board. And every day for the next 10 days, we're going to display their work so they can see what a wonderful job they did. And I'm so impressed. You can see they colored all in the lines. It's really wonderful. And they'll get to see the artwork that they did during the trip. And there is always time for a spur of the moment lesson with some of the children. Kasasaka in Malagasy in English is um, uh, day gecko. See? Day. Day gecko. Day gecko. It's his last day in Ranamafana. Eric's winding down his trip in preparation for leaving when he receives some news. An adult tree boa has been spotted alongside the road to the village. Finally, luck is on his side. We just started raining and we were looking for once to find some snakes today. They told me the snakes were all usually on the rocks and so we came up here to look for the snakes on the rocks. Didn't see any and then the guy just before said that the snakes, there was one here. He said, come back, come back. It's under the rock. He lifted the rock and we just pulled out this Madagascar tree boa, a wild one. And it's interesting because they come here to bask, but normal, they're tree boas, so they go into the trees, but they need to bask here because it's the warmest spot. Because Madagascar is not as hot as you think, so it's just amazing. And you can see, look at this, it's flicking his tongue, so cool. <laughs> look at it, it's sticking his tongue out, you see? And it has the heat sensing pits there. It's, oh, it's so awesome. Wow. <laughs> and it's what, oh wait, also look, it just ate, you can see, look, it just ate something. You can see the belly is, is big. It definitely just ate something. Your belly's big right here. It's all puffy right here, so it definitely ate, it's been eating. We have to put her back and leave her where she is. So we're gonna put it back under the rock. So this is where the rock was, and so we're gonna put her back under the rock where she was. Here, go back. Oh man, bye snake. The tree boa and Eric head for home. It's finally come time for me to leave Madagascar. I really don't want to leave. It was wonderful. I had so much fun. We got to see so many animals and do the sessions with the kids. It was great. But now it's time to go back and do some live sessions with the kids in New York. And um, I got to say goodbye to my friends. So Anya, thank you so much. Hey. Jose, thank, thank you so you. much for everything. It was really great. You guys are the best. All right, guys. Got to go. <laughs> All right, bye, guys. <laughs> Back in New York, Eric returns to the schools that took part in the internet sessions from Madagascar. The students have been following his progress and are full of questions. Did you find one species of chameleons that was endemic to Madagascar? All the species we found were endemic to Madagascar. Every single one. What were the people in Madagascar like? Oh, the they kids? They're like you guys, yeah. Same enthusiasm. What was it like Skyping from Madagascar? I guess you guys didn't see when I was running around crazy, but I think mm. Mrs. O'Shan did <laughs> the one I first, the first day. It was insane. Like, cause I, I, I This year's a little bit unique. So All the other years, he just sort of came in for his typical reptile show that he does. But this year with the yeah, Skype session, they already know who he is. In the hallway today, a couple of kids like, is that Eric? You know, they're really excited to meet him. And they can Skype with him, but at the same time, he's not getting rid of that face-to-face, so -face, hands-on contact, like, and he uses know, every moment so as a teachable stuff, moment. Just perfect example was today when he came in here and saw my sick turtle, and the whole kids got a lesson on abscesses in turtles' ears. When we were doing the Skype sessions, we were like, ah, like they were crazy, like all like excited, you know, while we're doing it. And then when I come back, now we can ask all these questions. How many species of frogs are there in Madagascar? Does anybody know? Um, How many? Um, no, more than twenty. Is more than twenty. Wait, who said what? So what? A hundred, yes. And where we were, that's right. You got it right. What kind of frogs did we see when we were there? What the kids are excited to hear Eric talk about Madagascar. We showed you another frog. Uh, um, the, tree, the, tree frog. the tree frog. Was it this one? They know he always brings a few surprises to show them as well. He does things that we can't do. He makes the curriculum alive. Skyping by going on the internet, but most important by having the animals here. It makes it real for the children. Back home again, Eric has not dropped his connection to Madagascar. <laughs> hey, look, 
Yeah, there's other kids, look, see? Salama! He is now doing internet sessions with the Malagasy students from his base in New York. Look, guys, he's eating. Oh, teachers, we're Skyping in Madagascar, so say hi to the kids. Say hi, you guys. There's all the teachers. You don't want to just come and do the show and then that's it, so... Now we're doing our weekly Skype sessions with them, so I still keep in contact with them and keep them motivated and excited. You guys all are gonna say um, Salama, all right? And Salama means hello in Malagasy. And so I want you guys to all say that to these kids, and um, we're gonna send it to them tomorrow. Salama! Our students here need to understand more international awareness. They need to have more international collaboration. Just from seeing the other children, they understand that there is something else out there, some people who look like me, and they might not have all the resources that they that we have, and we're sharing something in common, and it's Eric. And they were so excited about it. I can't tell you how many times they would come in for days after. Are we Skyping with Eric today? We can't get all the kids on a plane and take them on a field trip to Madagascar. But in this way, by their having the Skype connection with him, they were able to learn about a part of the world, otherwise probably most of them would never get to see. Being able to see that on the TV, communicate to each other, it, it was phenomenal. Eric Callender is changing the way children around the world look at reptiles and their environment. But Madagascar is only the beginning, as Eric looks to the future. There's so many places in the world that are like Madagascar. I'm hoping that these projects will be able to spread to other areas, not just in Madagascar, but all over, because I feel like you have these windows of, of opportunity to work with children. When they're younger and they're more impressionable, that's the time you want to really work with children. They should be aware that there are living things in their environment. One more thing, guys, I want you to say. 